So we're grateful to have Dan here. Um, he has a long and prestigious career in journalism and in fiction, but tonight we'll focus on the novels, uh, for which he has won uh, an Ian Fleming Award and a Dashiell Hammett Award, which are good names to be associated with. Um, and Unmanned focuses on a pilot operating a Predator drone who experiences something he cannot forget and uh, from which he cannot escape. And I will let Dan explain the rest. So please welcome Dan Fesperman. Thank you. And uh, thanks to Politics and Prose, it is one of the great independent bookstores. And uh, it's uh, ours and yours, uh, last line of defense against Amazon taking over the world. So uh, anytime you can come and buy books here, that's always a good thing. So thank you very much. Um, first, let me tell you what this book is not. Um, it is not what is known as, despite the title and the subject matter, it's not what is known as a techno thriller. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm not particularly a fan of techno thrillers. To me, any universe in which the, the workings of machines are more lovingly depicted than the workings of the characters are, they're pretty cold universes. And uh, my attitude towards them is sort of like, wake me when the last gizmo dies. And so, uh, uh, But perhaps I figured an explanation is probably in order in how I would then pick a subject like drone warfare to be at the center of a novel, if that's the case. Um, I think I got interested in it. There was a news story I read several years back, and it was talking about what life is like for these pilots. Uh, they're 7,000 miles away from the action. They're nine time zones away if their theater was Afghanistan and if their base was out in Nevada. And they're going into these little chilly, uh, isolated trailers uh, that look like if your kid's ever gone to an overcrowded school and they've got these mobile units, that's what they look like from the outside. And you walk in and you've got this god-awful, if you're a pilot from an F-16, as my character is and as a couple of fellows I talked to were, uh, you're used to being on the top of the food chain in the Air Force. You're climbing into these jets where it's the most comfortable thing you've ever sat in. Uh, as one pilot put it to me, you can think a thought and practically make it happen. You know, you turn your head and something happens. Uh, you're wired into every system in that plane. It's so perfectly ergonomically designed. You walk into one of these drone trailers and it looks like a dentist chair and you've got about four video screens and so does your sensor or sort of your co-pilot. And you've got two keyboards to type on and give commands. You've got a headset. Uh, one of the screens is for chat and you've got about five people looking over your shoulders. Some are talking to you. Some are sending you chat messages. Uh, they're all telling you what they think you should do next. Go take a look at this. Can we get a close-up of that? And it's this intense, tough job to do physically. And then maybe you're uh, zeroing in and watching these places for four hours at a time, two days at a time, uh, getting to know in a bizarre way the people there. And then maybe you have to suddenly blow up one of the houses or uh, people you're watching over, a military unit you're watching over, gets decimated. And then you have to review all of the damage over about a four-hour period. So you have this strange, intimate relationship with what you're looking at and what you're possibly destroying that you don't have in any other branch of the military or even the Air Force, yet you're as remote as can possibly be. So it's this odd combination of remoteness and intimacy that you don't have in any other job I was going to say in the military, any other job that I can think of, of any type. And despite all that, despite the stresses and pressures that would cause, at the end of the workday, uh, you are expected to leave all that behind. You get in your car, you drive home, you're expected to just kind of melt back into the suburbs and be a dad or a, 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 a husband, uh, and you're worrying about things by, like the sell-by date on the milk carton that you picked up on the way home. It's, it's completely a different world where you can't talk about what you've been doing all day. And if that doesn't make it tough enough, they rotate your shifts. For three weeks, you'll do the uh, midnight to 8 a.m. shift. For the next three weeks, you'll do the uh, 8 a.m. to eight hours after to the 4 p.m. shift. And then for three weeks after that, you'll do the 4 p.m. to midnight. So you can imagine what that would do to your sleep cycles and the dreams you're already having because of this weird job. So that's what got me interested. 
And that's what got me thinking on, uh, about doing research, talking to some pilots, and setting one of these drone pilots. And it's, it's sort of an oxymoron anyway. They call them a drone pilot because they're not in the plane. Uh, and to go from there. And uh, I'd like to read you an abridged version of my opening chapter. I'll condense it somewhat. And uh, I'll read you the pages uh, to kind of give you the flavor of, of the job, but to also kind of give you the flavor of the events that set things in motion for this pilot, which kind of put his life off the rails very early on and put him in a position to want to know later why it went wrong, why the intelligence was bad, what happened, and why did I end up like this. So I'll start with chapter one. 30 seconds to impact. On the video display, Captain Darwin Cole watches black crosshairs quiver on a mud rooftop. He doesn't budge the stick and rudder. No piloting needed now. All that matters is the missile, which Airman Zach Lewis guides by laser from a seat to Cole's immediate right. Ten seconds pass while Cole wiggles his toes, numb from the air conditioning. No one speaks into their headsets. Even the chatter screen is calm, as if everyone in their viewing audience was holding his breath. It's 3.50 a.m., and Cole's sense of detachment is so profound that he has to remind himself that this is not a game, not a drill. It's death in motion, as real as it gets, and for the moment he's reality's instrument of choice, the one whose name will go on the dotted line now and forevermore. His kill. A sobering thought any time, but especially when you're sitting in a trailer on the floor of the Nevada desert drowsy from breathing air that smells like warm electronics. Cole is a grounded fighter jock, as wingless as a plucked housefly. Yet here he is about to zap a room full of bad guys on the other side of the world. The upholstery creaks as he shifts in his seat. Nearly four hours in the saddle. Numb butt, numb toes, numb brain. Zack begins the countdown in a voice edgy with youthful eagerness. Ten, nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four. On the screen, sudden movement. The door of the house opens and a girl appears at the threshold. On Cole's 18 inch monitor, she is only three inches high, but the afternoon sunlight paints her vividly. Red shawl, white pants, blue scarf. She looks young, 10 or 11, and for a disastrous second, she gazes straight at the lens before she darts left, disappearing from the screen just as two small boys run out the door behind her. Sandals flapping. What the fuck, Cole says. Can you? Too late, Zack says. Zack shoves the joystick anyway, but it will take two seconds for his command to reach the missile across 7,000 miles of space and wiring, and by then the whole thing will be over. Cole's wide awake now, and in the panic flash of this final moment before the explosion, he is reminded that all his commands tonight have passed above the schools, rivers, farms, houses, malls, and highways of a sleeping America. Each twitch of his hand flick, flings a signal of war across the nation's night owls as they make love, make a sandwich, make a mess of things, or click the remote. The signal then hurdles the Atlantic, Europe, and the Middle East before finally reaching the bright blue afternoon of eastern Afghanistan nine hours into the future where at this moment his predator drone gazes down from 10,000 feet upon the stony valley and mud homes of Sandar Kosh, a remote village of farmers and herdsmen. Cole hopes the girl is running fast. The boys, too. Zero, Zack announces. The main screen erupts silently in a boiling cloud of fire and dust. Cole gawks. The job does not allow him to turn away. No one says a word. Already he feels the moment taking root in a fallow corner of his imagination, a seed of torment, a nascent preoccupation. From experience, he knows that during the next few hours, word of this event will filter from the trailer like a noxious gas. And by the end of his shift, the chaplain will be waiting, along with a shrink who insists on calling himself a medic, as if they were right there on the battlefield with the dead and wounded. As always, Cole will politely decline their offers of counsel, although doom seems to follow him everywhere lately closing in like a posse that rides only by night. For the moment, there is pressing business to attend to. to, attend to. He speaks into his headset. Zoom out, Zach. Where'd those kids go? Cole's mind wants to shriek, but his voice remains calm, a cool Virginia baritone in the reassuring timbre of pilots the world over. It is an intelligent voice of great utility, patient, and searching. 
Only seven hours earlier, it was reading a bedtime story to Danny, his youngest, employing the soft cadences needed to make a restless five-year-old fall asleep. Somewhere toward the back of Cole's brain, the book's rhythmic words still tumble as gently as socks in a dryer. In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon. The lens draws back. The wider view reveals three small bodies just to the left of the ruined house. The worst part is that Cole believes he knows these children, not personally, but in the way of all watchers who grow familiar with their subjects. He's seen them playing cricket in the rocky field by the old shepherd's house, digging onions with their mother, hauling firewood from the grove of poplars by the stream. He knows these homes in this village, although it is little more than a smudge on their tactical map. How can this be possible? Then he remembers. Zack and he snooped around here only a month ago with their predator, first by day and then after dark, switching the camera to infrared so they could lurk like an owl in a high pine while far below, cook fires burned, animals lay down in their stables, and children, these children, he's sure of it now, played in the open air of an October evening. And with that memory comes the realization that those three kids should not have been in that house, not the one that Zack and he have been watching so intently for four hours. He's not sure how he knows this. Something he noticed earlier, perhaps, or during tonight's stream of chatter, the ongoing cyber conversation between all the usual interested parties. We've got activity, Zach says. On the screen, two adults emerge from a neighboring house where the door has been blown off its hinges. They stagger as if dazed or wounded, chaplain-esque in their movements. A fresh dialogue fresh line of dialogue pops up on Cole's chat screen from someone using the call sign of Fort One. Gold letters on a black background. Fort One, nice shooting, check the truck. The truck, a white Toyota, is a key piece of the scene. Its arrival moments earlier was their cue for action, the agreed-upon signal that the targeted bad guys had moved into place and were now present and accounted for. Fort One is the mission's JTAC, or Joint Terminal Attack Controller. He has directed much of the action tonight, the stage manager of this drama. Cole knows him only from his call sign, assuming Fort One is even a he. Cole's CO, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Sturdivant, mentioned Fort One only cursorily during the pre-mission briefing, a tip-off that Fort One is from the intelligence side. He could be in Washington, the Pentagon, the CIA, even the White House, or he could be on the ground at the scene posted on a nearby hill. Theoretically, he could even be here at Creech Air Force Base, a bustling little place tucked against barren mountains a mere 40 miles from Vegas. He could be anywhere his laptop will travel, as long as he has the correct passwords and encryptions. Wherever he is, Fort One seems unduly satisfied with what they've just accomplished. Cole restrains himself from typing a snarky reply. Everything he says and does tonight will become part of the official record. His what-the-fuck from a moment ago already weighs against him, so now he must be doubly careful. Swallowing hard, he masters his tone and then says to Zack without turning his head, Our JTAC wants a look at the truck. Zack eases the camera right. A white shape emerges from the smoke and dust. Here it comes, Zack says, a slight tremor in his voice. I'll zoom it. Zack Lewis is only 22. A year ago, he was an image analyst examining satellite photos in quiet rooms. After six months here, he still seems to be acclimating to this life on a battlefront where the aftermath must always be studied, evaluated, autopsied. The truck's crumpled roof is visible beneath a collapsed wall. Little else of it is recognizable except some orange markings on the hood and a Toyota logo on the tailgate. The chat screen blips again. Fort One. Any squirters? Escapees, he means. So called because on infrared they display a squibs of light streaming from the action like raindrops across a windshield. Zack, on his own initiative, pans back towards the front of the house. Cole braces himself as the three small bodies slide back into view. His eyes are drawn to the girl. Incredibly, her body twitches. She's alive. The chat screen blips. Fort One, check the house again. Fuck that. Did Cole say it or just think it? Zack stays on the girl. Her right arm is severed and lies a foot from her shoulder with blood pooling in the gap. She struggles to rise, trying to prop herself on her left elbow. Cole watches but says nothing. Zack is also silent. The girl slowly raises her head. Fort One, I said the house. The man is obsessed, either with with death or with rubble. 
Cole opts for life and continues to ignore him, despite a growing sense that there will be consequences for himself, for Zack, for everyone involved. An old woman crosses onto the screen from the left. Reaching the girl, she bends stiffly to the ground. Her mouth opens wide, and so does the girl's. Cole's imagination supplies the soundtrack. Two voices in awful harmony, a cry that is keening and forlorn, as if someone had torn open a tender and damaged part of the earth, and this is the unbearable sound that issues from within. The time signature at the bottom of the screen flashes to 0400, but his mind is still lodged at 350, the moment of impact. Cole blinks. In four hours, his shift will end. He will exit the trailer, dodge the chaplain, brush aside the shrink. Then he will drive home on an empty highway with only these images for company. After 30 miles or so, he will ease into the dense weave of Vegas traffic and take the exit for his suburban refuge. He will click the remote to open the garage and enter the kitchen door with a smile for his wife. Then, while cartoons blare and the neighbor starts his mower, he will eat Saturday pancakes with his children. No one but him will know what has happened. Fort One, still need more from the house. Don't we all, thinks Cole, mesmerized. That's the end of chapter one. So. Um, and I'd like to take questions beforehand. I'd like to mention that uh, the eeriness of this job, I wouldn't have gotten nearly as good a feel for it had I not been able to talk at length with uh, one pilot in particular who liked Darwin Cole had piloted an F-16 beforehand. It took me four months to get the Air Force permission to go out to this base, and that was a bit of a rigmarole. But when I went, they did leave me alone uh, for three hours with this one pilot and his sensor. I talked to some others as well, but these two in particular, uh, they were both about uh, the same age as these guys, similar backgrounds, and uh, they the impression that uh, the observation they made that stuck with me was the longest was that they talked about how you really did get to know uh, people in these small villages that you would surveil for a full day or even two days. And they said it was this eerie relationship you'd have. And you also felt strange in that you knew it was this voyeuristic feeling as well. You knew they didn't even know you were up there, most likely, and much less watching their every movements down there. Uh, so there was this there is this godlike aspect to the job, and I, the most interesting slang I came across was that uh, at night, um, if they're watching over, say, a U.S. unit in the field, and that was the part of the job they liked best, actually, was not, you know, blowing stuff up. It was when they were doing reconnaissance and protection duties for these U.S. units in the field. They would, it sounds very boring, but they would basically keep a watch over them, you know, shepherds watching over their flocks by night as they slept in the field at night or as they were on the move, make sure, you know, no one was coming over the rise that they couldn't see. And uh, when these units would uh, be involved with trying to capture somebody and say some of these squirters would run out of a house at night, uh, they could throw down an infrared beam, which if you were on the ground and had night vision goggles, looked like a spotlight. And for the person who was captured in this infrared beam, you wouldn't even know it was on you. And it would light you up on night vision goggles, like I said, just like a spotlight. So their nickname was, for that was the God Light, they called it. So they would get, uh, these guys in these units would call to them on their headphones. They, and you'd, you'd tell them, you'd say, well, we've got five squirters moving to your east. And, says, what do you want us to do? And they'd say, throw down the God light. So they would, and it would light them all up, and they'd either shout for him to stop or just mow them down. So, uh, and meanwhile, these guys would be watching all that from 7,000 miles away. So that's the job. That's the strangeness of it. And you can imagine why there would be 25 to 30 percent burnout and high rates of depression and whatnot. Uh, uh, I was just mentioning, I, there's no way to quantify this, but uh, I would imagine that this has to be the highest stress to danger ratio in the military because there is no danger uh, except your commute in Las Vegas traffic. I guess that would count. But uh, no danger whatsoever, but the stress and the psychological burdens of it are way up here. You know, it's not like shell shock where you're fearing for your life or you're seeing horrible things in person. but. It's still a very strange job, and I, they're really going to have to figure out a way to help these guys cope. And I think one way might be, for instance, not giving them such wacky shift changes all the time. Anyway, any questions that uh, you guys have? Uh, but
book. Yeah. Would you mind coming to the microphone, please? Oh, right over here. There's the mic. Yeah. Dan, I was curious if the uh, character in your book, uh, former F-16 pilot, is that typical of the drone uh, pilots? Are they former fighter pilots by and large? Or I think it was more. It was more typical in the beginning because uh, the, now I think they're just taking guys who would be going into the pilot program and putting them straight into the drone program. Mm -hmm. But in the earlier days, they were yanking guys right out of units. In fact, this guy, like Darwin Cole, was called aside uh, at his base one day by his CEO, and he says, uh, says I got some shitty news for you, is how he put it, because these guys all hated it. That was so, my next question. Yeah. Did they volunteer, or they were the guy designated from the Maybe squadron? there are some guys who volunteers, but they, uh, they uh, pilots, hate, hated this thing. I think so. And uh, it was called that Xbox shit, was what they referred <laughs> to it. Interesting. And uh, they made up, uh, I quoted in here, um, I've got a little pilot bar scene very briefly mentioned here out near Nellis Air Force Base, which is right next to Vegas as opposed to Creech, which is about 40 miles out. And they've written all these derisive little songs about predators. <laughs> and there's one a song about they shot a predator down and, gee, how bad, too bad for that. It's like clubbing baby seals and all this <laughs> stuff. And uh, so they, they make a lot of fun of it. But uh, another thing about the military they, they, and how they regard the predator, this is sort of the ultimate triumph of what a lot of the guys up either on the ground or in the air called REMFs, which is rear echelon motherfuckers. Rips. And, yeah. and <laughs> this, is, this is their ultimate victory because, you know, they've got one of the most important jobs in the Air Force now. Yeah. And it's where a lot of the resources are going. And it's where the majority, I think, of pilots coming out now are going into this program. Yeah. Well, so. Thanks. It's yeah. fascinating. I guess I got the impression from your reading there that these drones are at quite a bit greater height than I seem to imagine. Yeah, uh, this one would have been at about ten to 12,000 feet, okay, which is often where they are. And if it's a perfectly still day, you can hear this. It, it's sort of the, it's like a two-stroke engine in the Predators. And it's almost like a, it was a snowmobile engine. That's right. That was the original engine. So it would be like... Can you hear a snowmobile at 10,000 feet? Maybe, but you know, can you see it? Probably not, unless the sun happens to glint off of it. So it, uh, if you're in a perfectly quiet place, like in the middle of a tribal area or Afghanistan, or maybe you can hear it, but yeah. I guess I had the impression that particularly the missions in Pakistan were conducted much closer to, um, to the ground. Not, most right. of them were not, okay. because they want to be out of sight. They don't want it to, to be known. And, and the missiles will take about a minute to get there. So from that high up. So. I, I enjoyed the double game with its listing of the sacred oh, scriptures thanks. listed in the back. Any yeah. particular reason why the British writer Gerald Seymour isn't on there? Uh, uh, no, but I mean, I've had people point out several more to me. I think a lot of his were, a lot of his were after 89 too, or, or after uh, the fall of the wall. And that the father who collected those books right. in there. It was great to read it. read things. My, my, both my parents enjoyed reading. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate it. Yes, uh, you uh, gave us the first chapter uh, and an incident. Uh, what is the rest of the book about? And do you uh, <laughs> probe any uh, uh, higher questions in the political or international field? Do you reach any conclusions? Uh, conclusions I don't reach because I figure that's up to you uh, and I'm not in it to, to try to drive people toward a conclusion. Uh, the rest of the book basically is uh, this unnerves him and pretty much destroys him to the point that he washes out of the program and he ends up uh, sort of out in the desert in another trailer living on his own. Maybe a year later he's gotten in some trouble in the meantime. And he's approached by uh, some freelance journalists who are kind of lost souls on their own. They've all taken buyouts from their newspapers and are realizing that's not going to pay the bills much longer. So that imitates life as it is, too. Um, and they're, they've come across, they're trying to get to the bottom of some of these intelligence screw-ups. And they figure, here's a guy who will, will be plugged in and maybe help us. And he's out of the whole process now. And we can try to find out, you know, what he knows. So they approach him, and they end up, he kind of cuts a deal with them 
to get himself out of this isolated place to try to work on that with them. But uh, it's kind of this uneasy relationship between two groups that normally don't work together that well. And three journalists sometimes don't work together that well either, especially if they're all sort of lone wolf types who are used to investigating things on their own. So they basically try to get deeper toward the heart of the matter and uh, it delves into a lot of aspects of what this is like as a job and uh, what we're doing up there and what the ramifications are, but no conclusions, like I said. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, after you. No. Uh, based on your research, can you give us a sense of what manned flight, when you compare the, I think you REMs, whatever, MF, whatever, REMFs, on this yeah. side, and manned flight, what the direction of kind of, I mean, you know, we're like, I don't know, say F-35 or one of those that we're spending a zillions of dollars on that, that seems to get run up the big bills and we're mm -hmm. going to have manned flight. Mm -hmm. Did you get a sense in, in where we're headed in all that? Is it, are we moving more toward the drones and a heck of a lot less of the high-end, expensive, attack manned vehicles? I think they would be if they were doing this strictly on need, uh, but I think the Air Force, uh, uh, a lot of high up people in particular don't like to see their budgets reduced. And if they start saying, oh, we, we don't want to build any more of these uh, you know, new fighters, they're going to see their budgets go way down. Cause drones are pretty cheap, although the deeper they get into the technology, they're becoming more and more expensive and they're getting more and more sophisticated. So I think they'll be able to justify their needs for high ticket items with drones before long and they're building so many of them as well but they will always be pushing for the most uh, there's a there's a character in here mentioned uh, and there's another character who supposedly was a friend of his uh, I don't know uh, if any of you all know much about aircraft designers and all this I did a long interview years ago with a guy named Pierre Spray and he was a principal designer of the F-16 fighter jet and also for the A-10 which was this very slow low flying armor plated on the bottom cannon gun basically which sole job was to knock out tanks and armor and it was unbelievably successful and the Air Force hated it why because it was slow it wasn't sexy to pilot nobody was that big on piloting it it was, you know, you couldn't make a movie out of it like Top Gun uh, and even though that was Navy it was and it was cheap and it just it didn't they didn't like it and and it was built almost against their wishes and I think in the Gulf War it knocked out 2,000 pieces of armor uh, it was the single most effective weapon more than the Abrams tank and all that stuff but anyway so this guy Pierre Spray I've talked to him a lot and he talks about this whole mentality of like they will take a fighter jet, he says, that is a perfectly good jet, and then they want to start adding things to it. They want to make it do six things instead of three really well. They want to make it do six things pretty well, and that drives, you know, it doubles the cost, and it gets a lot more contractors involved and a lot more states so it can be supported politically more easily, and it basically screws up the aircraft. And he was always fighting against that. The F-16 was a pure fighter jet, but over the years, later generations of it, they started, you know, making it more of a fighter bomber and this. And he said, all you do is just screw it up. But so that's sort of the mentality why you'll always have the big ticket jets, I think. Uh, the warning Eisenhower gave us about the industrial move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, right, the military industrial complex, I think he, he called it, and he was a general, so. Dan, yeah. I was hoping you'd talk or talk more about um, drones inside the United States. Yeah, what you've yeah. learned, and, what you and think. the book, uh, the book goes into that as well. There is a, a contractor, uh, sort of a Blackwater type company in this that uh, is wanting to branch out into sort of drone technology as well in this book, and that is an issue, and that will become an issue. Uh, Anybody who keeps an eye on the news has seen all these stories. The New York Times had a piece a couple of weeks ago. There are these small hobbyist drones, uh, which not nearly the capability of these, but some are pretty sophisticated, are starting to become a problem in Manhattan of all places. Uh, you know, there was one apartment complex that had to say, you can no longer use our, the driveway for your takeoff of your drones because one crashed on a terrace last week. Uh, there was one that was buzzing the George Washington Bridge and it got too close to a police helicopter. 
Uh, people are using them to, there was a congressman who got in trouble because he had hired a photographer to shoot his daughter's wedding from a drone or something, because you can get amazing shots. And where these hobbyists are getting into trouble the most often is by trying to get the most totally awesome dude photos and video footage, and they're getting some incredible stuff. Somebody sent one up in the middle of a fireworks display. If you go to YouTube and do like drone footage or whatever, you will get some incredible shots of that people are taking. They're flying these things all over the place. And eventually, uh, and, and, and there's a scene in this book where this fellow who's sort of a Pierre Spray type character, this kind of, uh, you know, a bit of a rebellious designer for the Pentagon, a civilian designer, uh, takes one of our characters to a very sophisticated do-it-yourself drones group that is flying these things around and they're sort of a cut above the average one and they've got some pretty sophisticated stuff and and he kind of gets a kick out of this and thinks this is kind of cool but then he has this thought where he thinks like well how would these guys react if you walked up uh, he starts thinking about these three quiet guys who took flight school lessons in Florida, you know, and everybody thought that was okay. And then how would they feel if some guy just walked up and said, hi, my name's Osama, and I'd like to build a drone for my friends. And, you know, what the possibilities for these things, many are good, but some can get into some pretty bad mischief here. So, and the FAA just can't get a handle on it right now. And even if they do, how do you really control it? So, anyway, so it, goes into those issues as well for civilian applications and whatnot. But any more questions? Yes. Yeah, one. I just wanted to follow up on uh, yeah. one of the last comments you made before yeah. we started asking the questions about um, the large fraction now of uh, pilots coming out of military flight school are now sent into the drone program? I'm not sure that? if they're coming out of flight school. I just know the Air Force is putting a lot of people who I think would have gone into pilot school. I think they're, it's, it's, this is their growth area for flyers, so to speak. Yeah. I, just, I don't know how it works, uh, whether they go to flight school or not. That's sort of since I did the research for this. Any so. idea of the numbers, you know, just kind I of don't. I don't now, and I'm sure whatever number I would have had a couple of years ago when I was writing this, it's, it's higher. I do know that the Air Force at one point, uh, and I haven't followed up to see how it worked out because it didn't factor into this book, but it's mentioned in here that at one point they did go out to the gaming community and solicit volunteers to go into training for piling this. They figured these were people would have this reflex you mm. needed, uh, <laughs> you know, they would be used to right. sitting on their ass for eight hours at a yeah, time right. and, you know, just looking at a screen, unlike right. their pilots, so it might drive stir, drive stir crazy. Right. So they did recruit some people into the program from that, but right. I don't know if that worked out well, poorly, or what, or if it just freaked those people out totally to actually be doing it for real. Well, if, it, if it's as many as, you know, it sounds like it is hundreds of people per year or per yeah. whatever. Um, and kind of given the number of um, drone attacks that we, he, you know, hear about in the news of yeah. the sort uh -huh. that, that your main character is yeah. involved in here, which would be a handful a year or yeah. 20 a year or whatever. Um, obviously, a lot of these new drone pilots are being used for other missions, like you say, yeah. providing cover right. for Right. Reconnaissance the is the main mission um, that they have and but, force um, protection those are the main two missions actually shooting is a, just a fraction of what they do and i should also point out that it, it, you know you always hear about the cases where they've erroneously hit the wrong target and it's not they missed the target it's just they had bad intelligence right. and they hit the wrong people such as in this one and i should point out that however as as a weapon when you do use it um if you hit the right target, uh, it's as probably the best possible aircraft for avoiding civilian billion casualties because you can take so long and uh, watch, you know, the targets. Right. Uh, I asked these pilots about. I said, if you know a guy that you want to hit is going to be traveling, why not hit him in the vehicle? And they said, sometimes we do. And I said, they said, but there are a lot of complications with that. They says because of that 60-second delay, you might be 
you know, you've got the laser signature on the vehicle, you're following it, you're going to be able to hit it, but maybe he'll take a turn and drive into a patch of woods. Maybe he'll take a turn and end up in a flock of sheep with a shepherd and three kids. And then you'll just have to divert the missile and then he knows he's about to get blown up. So there are those complications, but I said, well, what do you aim for? And he said, well, if you want to be certain to kill everybody in the vehicle, you aim for the roof. If you want to be certain to destroy and stop the vehicle and possibly kill everybody in it, you aim for the hood of the car or wherever the engine is. I guess they're not hitting too many Volkswagen Beetles with the engine in the back, I guess. But um, so it's, it's, it's weird. And those are the kinds of things they think about and get obsessed with. Yes. I was wondering, it's something I've been wondering about for a while, whether these drones will ever will replace people on the ground or whether these people on the ground are still needed to get mm -hmm. the intelligence going or whether these yeah, drones I, can Yeah, I mean, there's no, uh, they've already replaced some people on the ground, I'm sure. You, you don't need as many people on the ground for reconnaissance if you've got this. So maybe instead of having, sending a patrol out to look at something and risking the lives of 12 soldiers, you send the drone over there and then the 12 soldiers go in and know exactly where they're going and what to do. So it's already replacing people on the ground in that sense, but you, there's no substitute for whether it's for, you know, having humans on the ground, too. Although in the situation you've got right now, for instance, where they're trying to do everything in Iraq uh, on just this limited aid or limited, I guess, helping the Peshmerga and these other Iraqi groups, uh, I'm sure, you know, the drones were probably the first things that were in there trying to look at targets so when they send in the other aircraft they could you know go after these targets because in the book this well in the end the target was also identified by the drone yeah all right that's what yeah. usually happens yeah all yeah right. yeah we have time for one last question you mentioned the uh, a10 and memory fades but was that the warthog that was the warthog yes that's yeah. a hell of a piece of equipment yeah, uh, yeah whether it was, it was great well liked or not by the uh, yeah. hierarchy it was a hell of a machine it was one of the most effective aircraft ever did any of your pilots in quotes yeah. talk about their experiences when they have technical difficulties i have read in journals and things about what yeah. they have to do sometimes like fly it into a mountain because you can't bring right. it back because you can't tell for sure if it's going to yeah. be there yeah, they Thank did, you. and they these things, these things crash fairly regularly. I forget the number I've read, but uh, they lose more than they were letting on of these drones. And uh, you know, anytime you're flying something from that far away, you're going to have, you know, you're online, you have trouble with Comcast. I mean, you can imagine what you know. It's like you you call your tech guy. I just lost my drone, damn it. I mean, you know, it's like we'll put you on hold and give you to somebody at our call center in Burma. But uh, you know, it's it's it, it is tough, and they lose a fair number of these things. They have this function where supposedly uh, the drone is supposed to, if it loses touch with the controller, it's supposed to return automatically to where it's programmed to go. But that doesn't always work either. So yeah, they do. Yeah, and they, they did talk about uh, problems though, and they uh, oftentimes that would be a reason they might go past their normal shift because if if they're got an operation where they're going to hand off to another crew and it's an ongoing operation, uh, they've got this ethic about they don't want to hand off a hot potato. So if they're getting a possible engine malfunction light, and they're about to end their eight hours and there are four hours left in the mission, they'll go ahead and stay on and say, all right, we're not going to bring another crew in when this is potentially about to go belly up. So, yeah. So. Thank you. Thanks.